everybody and thanks a lot for the interest in blockchain. So blockchain, it's a, a huge buzzword, probably the buzzword of the year 2017, 2018. It's uh, still a vague concept, hard to grasp. Uh, not many people understand it and are sure what it, what it is about. So to open the talk today, I, I brought some physical items, actually. So I, I brought my Swiss passport. That's my centralized gateway to my Swiss identity. So uh, if I lose this, I have to trust the Swiss government that they give me a new one, right? Second item I brought is a banana. Now, when I bought this banana, I looked at it and there was a sticker on top that said um, biologically sourced. And this was a piece of plastic. And essentially, I have no way to verify that this banana was really biologically sourced. I just have to trust this piece of plastic, right? Third item I brought, this is actually my favorite one. It's uh, my certificate of residence from Switzerland. This is an actual physical paper that was kept in a vault in Switzerland, and I received it when I deregistered from Switzerland to come back. In German, it's called Heimatschein. I, I actually had to Google what, what it is in English because I wasn't sure. And this is an actual record that was kept there, and it was transferred to me via post mail when I deregistered. And the fourth item that I brought is my smartphone. Here there's tons of applications like Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn. And whenever I do anything in these applications, this gets recorded in a centralized database that is owned by these companies. I don't have to explain this to you guys. You know this best. Now, by now, you might wonder, OK, so what does a banana, a passport, a piece of paper from the German government, and my phone have to do with blockchain, right? What, how are these things connected? So these are all parts of our daily lives where we believe and where we say that blockchain can have a positive impact and can improve the status quo of today. Let's take identity. So I'm from a European country, so I have trust that my government gives me my identity. However, if I'm a refugee, and maybe my birth certificate got destroyed, and I'm traveling through different countries, I don't have any identity. So who is going to issue me an identity uh, if no country wants to do that and I have no way to prove my identity? Blockchain can help here by giving you a decentralized, self-sovereign identity that you start to build up slowly, slowly with different claims coming from different parties. The banana. So blockchains can help to increase as transparency in supply chains. Today, the reason why I have no way to verify where this banana is coming from is because there's tons of intermediaries and companies uh, involved in the process of delivering this banana, for example, from Costa Rica to Germany, right? And these companies, they don't exchange any data with each other because they don't trust each other. Blockchains can help to increase transparency in supply chain and provide consumers proofs of where their products are coming from. My favorite one, certificate of residence. This is really something you could put on a blockchain and transfer to my Swiss data wallet. And you can even go one step further and think of different blockchains in different countries that are interoperable so that all these uh, physical certificates that we have today, like land registries, marriage certificates, birth certificates, are stored in a blockchain and can be transferred internationally. So that if I lose this, I don't have to hope that the Swiss government gives me again one, but it's stored digitally and it's digitally owned and controlled by myself. And finally, a lot has been seen and said about how blockchains can help us get back control of our data. It would be much nicer if the data that is owned by Facebook is controlled by me and I can give access rights to the people who want to use this data to give me customized ads or customized products. And this is something where blockchain can help a lot as well. Now, if there are these amazing advantages that I just mentioned to improve all these areas of our daily life, why isn't it happening, right? I assume no one of you has a decentralized, self-sovereign digital identity or is able to verify where their banana came from. Why is it taking so long for these things to happen? These are the insights that I want to share today in this talk. So I'm from BigchainDB. That's a Berlin-based blockchain startup. And as part of our activities, we created a permissioned blockchain software called 
big chain DB. It's now fully open source, so we don't have any commercial activities around it anymore. We decided to give it to the community and focus on other projects because it is in a stable state and you can use it and we saw that it's more beneficial to, to open source it. Now, while we developed BigchainDB and had commercial activities around it, we were confronted with building applications, blockchain applications, and bringing them into production. So we interacted with enterprises, governments, startups, and learned about the day-to-day -day challenges that you face when you actually try to implement a blockchain application and bring it into production, because blockchain is still a very new technology. So to give you a bit of flavor about that, I'm going to start with uh, an extract from our old CRM when we still had commercial operations around BigchainDB to show you what industries we were getting requests from. So we had healthcare, energy, automotive, public services, supply chain, chemicals, financial services, IoT, identity, online marketing, media, sport, mobility, FMCG, software, audit, consulting, mining, construction, hardware, tourism, pharmaceuticals, agriculture, aerospace, NGO, travel. So what do I want to say with this is that we pretty much got a 360 degree picture on what people are trying to do and the challenges that these different industries are facing today. Okay. So what are these challenges? Why aren't we seeing blockchain progressing faster? Why is it taking so much time? I'm going to talk about six challenges that I learned about along the way while doing business development, talking to enterprises and uh, finding ways to bring blockchain applications into production. Challenge number one, consortium setup and governance. So if you look at a permissioned blockchain use case, for example, in supply chain, it typically looks like this. So let's say we want to track uh, a fresh product, a piece of meat across the entire supply chain. So you have a tag uh, on, on this product and it gets scanned and this information gets stored on a blockchain which creates what we call a digital memory of this product so that the end consumer can verify where this product came from. Now what you immediately see here is for this to happen, you need a production facility, a processing facility, a logistics company, a warehouse, a retailer to all work together and to agree we together are going to create a blockchain in order to increase the transparency in our supply chain. Now, you might know what happens if a bunch of corporates get together and have to discuss and agree on things. Sometimes it can look like this. Sometimes it can look like this. Conclusion is, it's not easy. Right? There's a lot of questions around intellectual property or how do we kick out a member in this federation if he misbehaves? How do we take on new members? Who has the intellectual property? Who governs upgrades in this software? So there's a lot of hack involved and discussions involved. So to make that a little bit more tangible, I give you a couple of examples of consortiums in the blockchain space and how long it took to set them up. So one is called Mobi. That's the Mobility Open Blockchain Initiative, and it's a consortium that unites approximately 70% of the automotive industry and is geared uh, towards developing blockchain automotive use cases. It took 12 months, so a full year, to set this consortium up with 37 members. And now the consortium is set up, but there are still no live use cases yet. They have just come together and agreed, okay, we make a foundation, we're all members of that foundation, and we start working together. Another consortium in Germany is called Enerchain. That's for energy-related use cases. It took around 10 months until this consortium of 23 utilities at launch uh, went live. Again, we see it takes a long time to move corporates and to convince them to start using blockchain. Another example to illustrate that struggle even a bit more is IBM. So IBM is very big in blockchain and they have invested heavily. And they took a different approach for supply chain use cases in blockchain. They said, okay, let's find a strong partner, Maersk, a global shipping provider, and let's create a joint venture, and let's first come up with a solution. So we develop a solution, and then we care about the consortium, and we start onboarding partners. And surprise, surprise, what is happening? They're struggling to sign up partners, because now they are the gatekeepers and controlling the solution, and others don't trust them. And again, it's difficult to onboard partners and convince them to participate in your solution. Challenge number two, 
What we learned along the way is that every blockchain project is first and foremost also a digitization project. A lot of enterprises, governments, are still stuck in digitization 1.0. So remember this example, right? Oops. So the Swiss certificate. If we want to put this on the blockchain, the very first thing we have to do is we have to decide that we get rid of paper, right? As long as we have not agreed that we want to get rid of paper, we're not going to be able to put such a certificate on a blockchain. Again, if you dig into supply chain use cases, what you'll see is a lot of the documentation involved looks like this or like this. So if we still rely heavily on paper, first, we need to get rid of paper, digitize, and then in the next step, we can talk about putting this digital information on a blockchain to increase the level of security. Again, to make that a little bit more tangible, an example from Switzerland. So yes, I'm from Switzerland, for full disclosure. That's why many examples are from my own country. So the Swiss telecommunication provider Swisscom made a study on the Swiss healthcare system. And they found that every year, 300 million of A4 sheets of paper are generated in the Swiss healthcare system. That's 820,000 per day, 220 tons of paper per small hospital, and seven trucks of weight per hospital. So imagine what this means. It's a huge amount of paper that is still involved. So if we uh, want to use blockchains to improve the control over electronic medical health records, we're going to have to do a countrywide digital transformation initiative to first get rid of all the paper, and then we can move into blockchain. Reason number three. So let's assume you have a consortium of companies that are willing to participate, and the information is available in a digital format. There's no paper. Then the next thing that you will encounter are the famous legacy systems. As soon as you start working with enterprises, you come across these players that you all know, I assume. Most of the data of enterprises is held in some of these systems, Oracle, SAP, Salesforce, and they power the backend and the data architecture of a lot of enterprises. Now, the challenge we have here is that blockchains were never really designed to be integrated with ERP systems. Right? So we have a bit of a gap here, and we need, to be f we need to find ways to bridge this old world of legacy systems and this new world of blockchains. Now, the challenge is that these systems are frequently the engine of a lot of companies because there are so many processes tied to it that if you start modifying anything in these legacy systems, a lot of processes are going to be impacted. So I usually say, as an analogy from the digital transformation world, it's a little bit like trying to uh, do some tweaks in the engine of an airplane while it's flying. It's extremely difficult because uh, there's a lot of processes that are impacted with it. So yes, legacy systems are a challenge. You need to find ways to bridge this gap. Reason number four. I call it regulation, regulation, regulation. So even though sometimes in the blockchain space we think that we're not impacted by regulation, actually we are, there's a lot of regulation involved. Uh, not only on ICOs and uh, on tokens, but also in the traditional blockchain space. So again, uh, I'll work with a bit of examples to make that a bit tangible for you what, what this regulation means. One of the use cases that we were frequently showcasing and pitching at BigchainDB was a digital blockchain-based vehicle lifecycle management. Great use case. You have a lot of parties involved in the digital registration of a vehicle. You have an OEM, the producer of the car. You have a bank. You have an insurance. You have a registration authority. You have a police department. Lots of different parties that don't necessarily trust each other and want to host a common database. So today, your car documentation is all over the place, right? Sometimes it's physically in your car, sometimes it's in a database of the police, sometimes it's at an OEM, at a car dealer, at a registration authority. So if you want to have a 360-degree view on your car, you have to go into each of these systems and find this data. So with a blockchain, you can help these different parties to share and exchange data so that you have one single source of truth of your car-related data. It's a great use case for blockchain, but there is one little tweak. When you start working on it, you realize that in Europe, there's some regulation 
that requires some physical car documentation or some car documentation still to be maintained physically. Now imagine what this means. It means that you have to start lobbying to get rid of physical car documentation before you can move into blockchain. And what then happens is that your blockchain innovation project actually turns into an EU lobby regulation case, which is a pity because the use case itself would make a lot of sense. Another example, lots of people have written about peer-to-peer -peer energy trading and blockchain. So if you look at the energy space, it's an industry that is going through a natural decentralization with more and more people producing their own energy. There's a disintermediation of utilities. And if an industry itself is fundamentally decentralizing, it makes a lot of sense to have a decentralized infrastructure as well to process all these peer-to-peer -peer transactions that people are going to do. If I sell my, uh, uh, the energy that I produced on my rooftop to my neighbor, it makes sense that this transaction is not processed by a utility, but by a decentralized infrastructure. Now, again, if you dig deeper here, the devil lies in the details. This is now changing, but there's a law in Germany that prevents peer-to-peer -peer trading because if you, as a producer of electricity, sell it directly to someone else, you might be considered some kind of utility and you need a license and there's regulation and documentation involved. So as long as this doesn't change, peer-to-peer -peer energy trading will not be possible. Right? So regulation is a challenge and it's something that we have to work on. Fortunately, there are uh, companies and associations that are working on that, like the Bundesblock, for example, in Germany, who is lobbying to make regulation more blockchain friendly. Reason number five, immaturity of blockchain technology. So blockchain has only been around for t exactly 10 years, actually. So uh, on the 31st of October was the 10th year anniversary of Bitcoin. So it's still a fairly young and new technology. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done in order to make it production ready and to make it enterprise ready. To give you a few examples of what this exactly means. One important part is key and identity management. So blockchains are decentralized, which means you control your own digital asset with your private key, which is kind of a password that only you hold. So there is no system administrator that can restore this password. So if you use blockchains in production applications, you need a way to manage these keys. Either you need a software on your phone that uh, allows you to use this private key, or you need a hardware security module where this private key is stored. But to make blockchains usable, we need a nice and clean solution for key and identity management. Second challenge, blockchains were designed for transparency. They were not designed for privacy, right? So in Bitcoin, every node in the network is aware of all the transactions that everybody has done. So there is full transparency. Now, if you go into enterprise applications, this might actually be a challenge, right? Because in a supply chain use case, maybe you don't want the manufacturer to have all the information about this banana. Maybe only some information should be visible to him. So we need to work with encryption and privacy. We need to find solutions for blockchains to ensure that we can selectively grant access rights to information to particular parties. And this is a very important piece when you move into the enterprise space. Next challenge, probably the one that has been spoken most about, is scalability. So blockchains have one big problem. Blockchains are a network of computers that are continuously exchanging messages and agreeing on one version of the truth, on a commonly shared state. So they're continuously gossiping. If I send a transaction to a node, this node puts it in a block, propagates the block to all the other nodes in the network. They all need to agree that this is a valid block, reach consensus, and then the block is put in the blockchain. Now, if you have tons of computers continuously talking to each other, it's obvious that blockchains cannot handle very high throughput. They can handle only a very limited amount of transactions per second. And this is a challenge, again, if you look at large scale production applications. And the fourth aspect is interoperability. So blockchains are still in the baby stage. So they are isolated networks, right? So this means if I set up my IBM um, Maersk supply chain, 
the supply chain uh, blockchain doesn't communicate with Ethereum or any other blockchain that someone else might have set up because there is no commonly agreed protocol to exchange messages among different blockchains. And this is very important when we think about scaling blockchains because ideally, in the future, you will not only have one blockchain that rules them all, you will have tons of parallel blockchains that are able to exchange messages with, e with each other. However, to be honest, maybe I'm a bit biased here because I'm coming from a tech startup. I believe that this is the smallest challenge because if we look at the degree of talent that we have in this space and the amount of people that are working on finding solutions for these problems, I'm not worried that we will find uh, and develop solutions that help blockchain to increase the level of maturity. So I usually say many smart engineers working on it. If you get a group of blockchain developers together, you give them resources, they're going to figure it out. Challenge number six, the last one. What I learned along the way is I usually say that blockchains make a lot of sense in a world we might move into. And this might take a little time. What does this exactly mean? Pretty vague and abstract, right? So again, I'll work with examples to make that a bit tangible for you. So remember the entry statement I made with my phone on Facebook, get back control over your data, give access rights to people, control your data, right? Now, blockchains make sense if users do care about their data, right? So we are in our small blockchain bubble and we say, Facebook is bad, uh, we need to get control over our data, we need decentralization, etc. Now, if you move out of our small blockchain bubble and you go on the street and you talk to people, you realize that actually most people don't really care about what is happening to their data. There have to be a couple of more severe data breaches and Cambridge Analytica scandals until people start really asking questions and they say, okay, I want to know what is happening with my data and I want control over it. If there is a social movement that is putting pressure and is pushing for these things, then blockchains become really interesting because they can provide solutions for that, right? The other example I usually make is blockchains make a lot of sense if you have autonomous machines, autonomous devices, IoT devices, uh, the essentially industry 4.0 economy where machines are transacting with each other and are autonomous. Because if you have autonomous devices, autonomous machines that need to be self-owned, self-controlled, it makes sense to have a decentralized infrastructure as well to power all these transactions. However, if we look out on the streets, we don't have autonomous devices and autonomous vehicles or autonomous trucks yet, right? So if we do move into a future like that, then it would make a lot of sense to have a decentralized infrastructure powering that. But again, this takes some time to happen. And the last part I usually mention is what we learned with the internet is that adoption takes one generation. And we still haven't passed through that generation. Blockchain is at year 10, but actually it is around year three, four, because for the first five years, blockchain was only Bitcoin. And only around 2014, 15, we started realizing that we can use this technology for other stuff than Bitcoin and money. So to sum it up, where do we stand today? 2009 was, what is Bitcoin? What is this thing? 2012 was, Bitcoin is bad because it's used for drug trafficking and it's not good. Right. 2014 was, Bitcoin is bad, but actually maybe blockchain is good because there's interesting things you can do with it. 2018 is, okay, blockchain is good, but it's complex. And we need to study and understand the high value use cases and understand better how we can overcome these hurdles and increase adoption. So by now, you probably think, okay, there's all these challenges, so complicated, paper, regulation, scalability, this is never going to happen. So maybe you think this. Now to continue the talk, I want to cheer up the mood again a little bit and talk more about solutions and what we can actually do to increase adoption and overcome these hurdles that we have today. 
because I don't believe that this is true. Blockchains do have amazing benefits and advantages, and uh, I believe that we do need the Web3 moving forward. So how can we increase adoption? What is it that we can do already today? The first very simple trick is work with startups. Right? There's a ton of blockchain startups that are doing amazing work, and they progress at a much faster pace than enterprises or governments do. So while we were busy thinking about supply chain use cases and medical records and peer-to-peer -peer energy trading, in December last year, this happened. And for those who don't know what this is, these are crypto kitties. <laughs> so these are unique digital cats. And this was a game that was developed on the Ethereum blockchain where you can buy a unique digital object and own it, and then you can breed it with other digital cats, and you can resell this newly created digital cat. And the amazing thing is this was using an Ethereum standard, which was a, a non-fungible token, so kind of a non-fungible cryptocurrency that digitally really only exists once and is owned and controlled by yourself. So you can digitally own this cat. Now, <laughs> This might sound silly, and a lot of people laughed about it, but there's some interesting statistics. So in December, uh, it was launched around November, and uh, at the beginning, the transaction volume of these crypto kitties was almost zero. And then at the beginning of December, it exploded and went from almost zero to several millions of US dollars that were transacted in these crypto kitties because people completely went crazy and started buying and selling these digital cats to the point where the Ethereum blockchain was not even able to handle these transactions. So I was seeing on Twitter people complaining, hey, I'm testing my supply chain use cases on Ethereum and there's a backlog of transactions because people are buying and selling like crazy these digital cats. What the hell is going on, right? Now the hype has already slowed down a little bit around crypto kitties. But the important takeaway here is this was the first viral production blockchain use case. And this is a completely new business model that no one thought about when blockchains were invented. Unique digital cats. What does this even mean, right? But this shows that startup can, startups can be a way to increase adoption and to raise awareness because CryptoKitties drew a lot of attention to Ethereum. People started understanding, became curious, and said, OK, I understand. This makes sense. So working with startups can be a great way of increasing adoption because they can come up with completely out-of-the-box innovation. Next important part of startups is in the blockchain space, they have a lot of money. <laughs> so you have probably have followed the ICO movement. I looked up the numbers. 2017 and 2018, a total of around 12 billion US dollars have been raised in ICOs. Now that's devalued already a little bit with the value of Ether dropping, but it's still a lot of money. So there's a, a couple of thousand blockchain startups today. So if you take this figure and you do the math, you realize that on average, Every startup has a couple of millions of resources available. So purely statistically, even if you assume a very, very low success rate of like 0.1%, if there's thousands of startups with money, some of them are going to create something useful and something intelligent just by the law of statistics, even if there's a very low chance of success. So to give you again a little bit of insights from our side, while we had commercial operations on BigchainDB, startups that were building on BigchainDB, we got a lot of inbound requests from startups saying, OK, we want to use BigchainDB for our application. And they were literally from different industries all over the place. For example, finance, we talked to decentralized exchanges, data monetization use cases. We had use cases in e-commerce, startups building decentralized Amazon, uh, doing on online marketing solutions. We had healthcare use cases around monetization of health data, uh, gaming use cases, identity use cases, IoT, supply chain, media, and other use cases that you can't even think of. So there's a lot of startups out there experimenting, thinking about how we can use blockchain to build real life applications. And helping these startups, giving them feedback, working together with them is one of the main ways how I believe we can increase adoption in this space. Trick number two, work with pioneers. While enterprises and governments are slow, there are some pioneers out there. 
there are some multinational companies that are very bullish on blockchain, and there are some governments that are extremely bullish on blockchain. To give you again some examples from our side, we worked, for example, with the Toyota Research Institute, who was the one that created Mobi, this consortium of car companies. And they have been very bullish on using blockchain to enable autonomous vehicles. <laughs> Another example is Bosch. We never worked with Bosch, but they have been doing a lot of really good research on how to merge blockchain and IoT and create what they call the economies of, of things. Energy has invested in a lot of startups and has also tested a lot of energy trading use cases. So there are enterprises that are bullish on blockchain, are investing in it, and have the necessary resources to push that forward and really believe in it, and are willing to take the risks that are also involved in going down this path of innovation. The same holds with governments. The government of the Netherlands is probably the most amazing one. They have done 30 plus pilot projects in blockchain across the whole spectrum. So from identity to land registries to car registrations, they have tried it all. And I've seen government officials like the state secretary from the Ministry of Kingdom Relations talking in public about how the, gov the government of the Netherlands wants to be at the forefront of innovation in the blockchain space. And seeing someone from a government saying that is amazing, honestly, because you don't see that with a lot of technologies. And I'm personally very convinced that um, blockchain can make a lot of sense for the public sector and it will be one of the places where we will see a lot of adoption. And one of the major reasons is in the public sector you don't have these competitive dynamics that we saw when it comes to consortium governance. Right? So there is no problems around IP involved if multiple governments need to work together. They just need to find a way to save costs and improve efficiency and that's enough for them to implement a use case. And the last trick is what I call educate the world. So the blockchain space is still very small, and we are in a bubble. It's a couple of million people that are involved in the space. If you go out on the streets, by now most of the people know or have heard of Bitcoin, but then blockchain is still uh, a mystery to most of the people. So to increase adoption, one important thing for us from the blockchain space is to do this. So yes, I've already given this talk once. It's not the first time, unfortunately. You see, the banana was a bit nicer, but uh, go out and talk about blockchain. Explain it to people, explain the benefits, explain why we need to care about it and why it is important. So to close the loop and come back to the beginning, how we started the talk. Who is building the future today? I'll give you a couple of examples of people that are working on items and solutions to improve these things that I mentioned in the beginning. The first one I want to mention, so identity, passport. Uh, there's a startup in the Netherlands that is working on decentralized identity for refugees, an amazing use case. And the way it works is they have a, a partnership with an NGO uh, that provides services to refugees. So when the refugees come to this NGO, they get, digitally, they get a digital identity that is linked to a device, for example, a phone. So they have a private key, and this is registered on a blockchain. And now what this NGO does is they give this refugee an attestation, which is a signature with their own private key that is linked to the identity that is registered on the blockchain. So an outsider, outsider can now verify that this refugee has an identity that is verified by the Red Cross. And with this credential that they have, they can now get services from the Red Cross or any other NGO that is issuing this certificate. So they have the NGO identity. Now what might happen is a bank says, okay, if you have the Red Cross credential, I'm gonna give you a bank account and I'm gonna give you the bank attestation, which is another signature provided by a bank that is linked to your identity. So you already have two attestations, one from an NGO, one from a bank. Now maybe an insurance says, okay, if you have the bank attestation and the NGO attestation, I'm gonna give you insurance and I'm also gonna give you an attestation. So you have already three. And bit by bit, you, build, you create a decentralized digital identity and maybe, hopefully, one day, 
a country will say, okay, if you have all these different claims, I have enough of a proof of who you are that I'm going to give you a passport, and now you have a real identity. So this is a great use case that also really makes sense to be decentralized, because who should control this identity? Should it be the NGO, the bank, the insurance, or a country? Ideally, it's no one, right? It's your own identity that you build up bit by bit. The second item was the, the banana, right? So who is working on solutions for food product provenance? Scantrust is a company that we worked with. They have a very interesting solution, which is a copy-proof QR code. So it's a QR code that is unique. So if you take a picture of it and you reprint it, then you cannot scan it anymore. And what does this enable? It enables to give products a digital ID. So you take this QR code, you scan it, and you register it on a blockchain. And what you have is what we call a digital twin. So you can create digital twins of any type of product you can think of. It can be a piece of meat, it can be a batch of bananas, and then you can start tracking this item, right? So the manufacturer can scan it, add information to it. Then there is maybe a certifier, like in this coffee use case, a certifier that also scans this unique QR code that adds a certificate on top of it, which says this is biologically sourced. Then there is a shipping company that adds information on when this was shipped. And like this, bit by bit, you create an immutable, unique digital audit trail on this fresh product so that I can scan this QR code or whatever it is in a shop and get access to the full history of what has happened to this product. And they are working on a variety of use cases also in the food space. Next use case was the Heimatschein, the certificate. So uh, I haven't found a government that actually is digitizing exactly this, but there are many governments that are working on digitizing land registries, and Sweden is one of the pioneers there, so they have a, a, a close-to-life pilot use case where they are digitizing and putting land registries on a blockchain and enabling transactions from one party to the other. And the last item I mentioned was the phone. You remember Facebook, the data. Get back control over your data. So I'm going to be very honest here. I haven't found a project yet that is solving that in a very good and convincing way, because it's a non-trivial problem to solve for two reasons. First reason is, how do you convince people to stop using something like Facebook and use a decentralized social media and care about controlling their data? And then there are also some serious technical challenges that still need to be solved for this to happen. However, there is one project in Europe that has laid the groundwork for this to be possible, and it's called GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. Now, you might wonder, what the hell does this have to do with getting back control over your data and social media? It's very simple. So GDPR was uh, introduced this year in May, and it's uh, one of the EU data protection regulation that actually impacts the entire world, because as soon as you have a European citizen in your application, you need to care about GDPR. And it gives you a couple of rights over your data. And I'm going to mention two of them that are very relevant for these use cases. The first right is the right to data portability. And what does this mean? It means that these companies like Facebook, with GDPR, they have to give you the possibility to download your data in a machine-readable format so that you can take it and you can put it somewhere else. And the machine-readable part is very important. This wasn't there before. Before, it was fine if you just give someone a stack of paper, and then how are they going to put this into a digital app? It's close to impossible. But with GDPR, you can force these companies to give you your data in a machine-readable digital format. So you can actually get your data. And then the other right that you have that you probably all have heard of is the right to be forgotten. So you can force these companies to delete all the data that they have about you. With Facebook and Google, this might be a bit trickier because of their terms and conditions. But in theory, what you can do now, today, is let's take LinkedIn. You download all your LinkedIn data, you take it, and then you exercise the right to be forgotten, and your data is deleted there. So you have your data now, and now you have control over it, and you can start using a blockchain application that enables you to give access rights to people to use that data. So overall, the groundwork has been laid, and now we need a couple of cool, smart, and motivated startups that really build a technically viable solution to solve this. 
So the conclusion of all of that is we are on a long journey. We still have a long path to walk, and there's lots of turns left and right and hills that we need to climb. But there is a path forward that we can follow. We just have to work hard and continue believing in it. Thank you.